And yes, okay. Good afternoon, everybody. This is Patrick from the Poison Pen Bookstore in Scottsdale, Arizona. And we're here with another of our virtual events. And it's a real pleasure to have Matt Goldman with us, albeit virtually. We'd love to have him back in person. Um, you've been, I think, for almost all of your books, you've been here in person. Yes. Yeah. Um, Matt's going to be talking about his brand new book, Carolina Moonset. And uh, we've made it a selection of one of our clubs and completely sold out of the hardcover. So what do you say there, Barbara? It's, it's, it's a good lesson to be learned about get in there on these clubs fast, right? Because we do sell out. Absolutely, uh, because we can't do an unlimited number of books. And so, you know, when they sell out, most of the time now they're gone. Right. And um, but they've done a, a simultaneous hardcover and trade paperback. And this is a really beautiful cover design. Matt, are you happy with it? I'm thrilled with that cover design. Yeah. I, I have uh, loved all my covers with Forge, and they really uh, did a wonderful job on this book. Right. Yeah. So everybody watching, if you have questions for Matt, you know, as they occur to you, um, just go ahead and put them in the chat feature or comment feature on YouTube and Facebook. And um, Barbara usually brings me back on screen towards the end of the hour. I'll be happy to ask any questions you might have. So I feel like Lester Holt over here, but Barbara, over to you. Thank you very much, Patrick. It's wonderful to see you, Matt. I'm so sorry you're not here, but then again, it's a hundred and something. So yeah. Sure are you home in Minnesota? Or are you done? I'm in Minnesota right now. Yeah. Oh, well, see, it's the flip side of the year. Yes, I know. I got to start uh, having them release my books in January exactly. so I can come and get yeah. some nice weather. We'd yeah. rather be in Minnesota, but in January, <laughs> we'd rather be here. So we first met Matt when his wonderful Neil Shapiro Private Eye series, and I loved his first book because it had the most wonderful premise for defying forensic investigation. Do you want to remind us, Matt, what it was? Yeah, the book is called Gone to Dust, and the crime scene is uh, somewhat unusual because uh, both the body and most of the house are covered from the contents of vacuum cleaner bags, hundreds of vacuum cleaner bags and all that dust and dirt and fiber and DNA samples in there have contaminated the crime scene so badly that forensics can do nothing. They, they, they really have to sit on their hands and that's why the police department feels it's necessary to bring on a consultant and that's how I introduced my PI, Neil Shapiro, in that book, yeah. And what's his background, man? Nils. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he is. He was a Minneapolis police cadet and he was laid off right after they graduated. And that really happened in Minneapolis. And and everyone knew they would be hired as, as police officers within a few months. But Nils decided not to wait. And he got his P.I. license and he, he like a lot of P.I.s, he's more of a go it alone kind of person anyway. And so he uh, he went on and made his career as a private investigator after being trained by the police. Well, I mean, it's true that he has fewer resources if he's not in the police department, but he's more autonomous. So it's yes. a trade-off, isn't it? Yeah, and in uh, and you know, in in real life, the police and private investigators can have a symbiotic relationship uh, and help each other out from time to time. Um, so the more private investigators and police officers I talked to, I learned about that. So we went on to write, or we went on to read, Matt went on to write, yeah. actually. Broken Ice, The Shallows, and Dead West. And now he's done something completely different, and I have to say that I missed it. I didn't even see it when it came out. Because originally, did this publish in May? May 31st, yes. Right. So greatly to my amazement, I suddenly discovered a book by Matt Goldman called Carolina Munset, which didn't look anything like a Neil Shapiro book. And I thought, no. what has happened here? Um, <laughs> because I love Matt and his writing, I thought, well, you know, hot dog. So I picked it up to read it. And it is a really wonderful story. Um, and there is, there is crime in it. But, um, but that's not really the thrust of the story. So... Um, I'm interested in why you decided to write something so different. Well, my publisher asked me to. <laughs> oh, okay. uh, they, I mean, I, and I think that's from talking to my author friends, 
a, a lot of these series now go three or four. And they they wanted me to write a standalone. And, and I was excited to write a standalone. Um, and so that's why I took a shot at this. And, and you know, in this book, uh, Joey Green, who's a middle-aged guy who lives in Chicago, goes to visit his parents who've retired to Beaufort, South Carolina. And uh, he's really going to help his mom because his dad suffers from Louis body dementia. And I know about that because my dad suffered from it. I don't claim to be an expert on it, but I wrote, I, I think I wrote my dad fairly accurately. The, the character of Marshall Green is, is different than my dad, but the disease is exactly the same. Um, and so, you know, my dad lost his short-term memory, and, but, and he was a talker. He was always wanting to talk about something. But when he couldn't talk about the weather or politics or sports or what he had for lunch, he started telling stories from his childhood and stories from my childhood, things I had never heard before. It was actually a nice silver lining to his dementia that uh, because he could always remember me and my kids and, and everything about his childhood in great detail. And, you know, after he passed away, the writer and me thought, well, what if, what if a character had that? disease and started talking about a story they didn't know about that could bring up a family mystery. And that's really the seed of Carolina Moonset. Wow, I didn't realize that it sprang from your own life. Isn't Robin, Robin Williams said Louis body dementia? I think he did. Decided. That's why he eventually committed suicide because yeah. he didn't want to ride that whole thing out all the way through. And it's a, it's a neurological disease, right? Yeah, it often presents as Parkinson's and Alzheimer's, but when they get the diagnosis right, right, it's one thing, Lewy body disease, yes. Sometimes called Lewy body dementia or Lewy body disease. So, and I've I've had a I've heard a lot from the community of people who have someone with dementia in their family or healthcare professionals, and they've really responded positively to the book. Well, I thought you wrote it wonderfully well with great sensitivity, but I also think that the relationship that Joey um, encounters, because the parents sort of want to fix them up, and that's usually the kiss of death, right? But Joey yeah. is divorced and in his 40s, and he meets a woman who um, he's sort of compelled to meet a woman who is 40 and divorced. And I thought that you handled that whole thread of the story so well i mean they live in different cities she's from boston right he's from yes. chicago she mm -hmm. has a career she has children that are established there he has his career and children and what is it they're they're facing uh, but because they are engaged in what turns out to be this investigation and so forth in beaufort they get to know each other and mm -hmm. um, and so eventually they're able to build a relationship. And I thought you did that really brilliantly. Oh, thank you. Thank you. I wanted, well, you know, that comes a little bit from my life as well uh, on two fronts. One, when I was in my 40s, I was single. And my parents were constantly trying to fix me up with, with somebody. Um, and, and so, uh, and when I'd go down and visit them, because they lived in Beaufort, they retired there. And uh, they would always mention people they knew who had people my age visiting their parents. And that's that's kind of where that came from. I also wanted to give Joey a uh, partner as this family mystery came up, somebody with whom he could investigate. And, and uh, I don't think it gives too much away to say when they're kind of set up on a first date, Leela, who's a psychologist, has this plan she said, since we, we're only going to be here a week and then we're going to go our separate ways rather than present the best part of ourselves. And in a normal situation, if, if we started dating, you know, six months down the line, we'd get tired of that and show each other our true selves. Let's just tell each other the worst things about ourselves right now and see if we want to spend any more time together this week. And that was kind of a fun way to kick off uh, those two meeting each other. Um, and, 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 and spending some time together. Well, I agree. You did set up the sort of classic ticking clock 
you know, which mm -hmm. um, powers a lot of thrillers. But in this case, it has to do with whether they have time to explore their relationship. But they both have a great sense of humor. And I think, um, you know, neither one of them is bitter, uh, which I think helps a lot because people who are so angry from their previous marriages. Yeah. Yeah, uh, I, that can be so toxic, it spoils everything. But they seem to have reached some accommodation, each one of them, to what happened. Um, yeah, they've both been single for a while. They've both dated for a while. So when they meet someone they click with, it, 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 and it's significant to them. Yeah. Yep. Now, I have spent time in Buford, but it was a really long time ago, back in the late 70s and early 80s when mm -hmm. I lived in Virginia, we used to take um, the kids to Hilton Head for um, part of their summer break. This was before Hilton Head became way so right. developed. It was a lot um, a lot smaller paradise and a lot less populated. Um, right. You know, lovely. And part of that was always the fun of driving from Hilton Head down to Savannah, which is a wonderful mm -hmm. city. And to do that, you would go through Beaufort, South Carolina, which yeah. I am here to tell you was the speed trap of the United States. <laughs> that was where their revenue mm -hmm. came from, was they were ready for the tourists, and it was. So, you know, anybody that had gone through Beaufort more than once knew the score. And, right. you know, so I remember that. I remember the harbor because, you know, it had lots of, um, I'm sure, probably much more like mega yachts now, but in those days, more modest boats. And I can remember that area sort of dripping with, um, um, what's the, you know, the-, the Spanish moss. Yeah, thank you, Spanish yeah. moss that, you know, so Beaufort was a, a kind of a sleepy, older Southern, you know, town. And I have a horrible feeling that just like Hilton did, it's probably not like that anymore. Part of it still is that way. It has definitely grown. And I've been going there my whole life. Uh, it's one of the reasons I set the book there. I do know it a little bit. My mother's side of the family, uh, when they came to this country, settled in Beaufort. Oh, yeah? So I have family going back a lot of generations. Uh, and it, it has definitely grown. But they ha have also done a good job, I think, of, of preserving some of the the architecture and, and the places there. Uh, when the Northern Army came through, uh, I don't know exactly why, but th I know they burned a lot of towns, but they did not touch Beaufort. So there's a lot of uh, uh, antebellum charm still there, buildings going back to the 1700s, in fact. Well, I know so, that Hilton Head, uh, to its credit, maintained even then, a very, very strict building code. It was like, mm -hmm. you know, even McDonald's didn't have golden arches. It all had right. to look like. Um, and I, I wondered if Buford, um, adi you know, had taken the same path and, you know, tried to protect its architectural heritage and not let people come in and, you know, blow it all. Yeah, up. I mean, there, there are more. I mean, not not every building looks like uh, it's, they're not all built up on those pylons for hurricane waters to go under, but, but they have preserved a lot of it. A lot of it is still there. Those big old oaks with the moss in them are there. Uh, the palm trees everywhere. And it's on the, Buford itself is not on the, on the ocean like Hilton Head is. Right. It's on the intracoastal waterway right. and it's full of tidal creeks and, uh, all sorts of water. You're always looking across water and marshland. Uh, yeah, it's a, it, and both of the Carolinas are beautiful places. Well, they are. I know marshland is a big thing. In fact, Savannah's, you know, it is a port, but it's not an ocean port. Savannah is, is up, what is it, like 40 miles up river or something? Yes, yes. And, I'll, and I remember one occasion we were there. Uh, we were up on the bluff, you know, looking down on the um, on mm -hmm. the river because there, um, the 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 old docks and the old wharves were down on the water, but there was a lot of more recent stuff up on on the bluffs. And we looked down the river towards towards the ocean going down, and along came this beautiful ship in full rigging. I mean, mm. beautiful sailing ship, and and there were people all up in the rigging, up in the masts and so forth. It was oh, really? an amazing sight. And it turned out that this was the Coast Guard training ship. I'm trying to remember the name of it. 
And these oh. were all Coast Guard cadets that were, you yeah. know, on, and, and it was just, it was such a drop back into the past, you know, to see this wonderful ship under full sail with people in the rigging and all sailing up river towards Savannah. And, you know, it's not that often that you get a real bygone sense, but I thought that particular day we really did. Yeah, yeah, it is beautiful. And Savannah's close, which is a, a, another nice feature there. Um, it is. So yeah. what is the, what's the central um, mystery of the story? You've got, he comes down there because he thinks his mom needs help caring for his, his, his dad. His mom just needs a break yeah. as, as a caregiver. And so uh, she has been invited to play in a pickleball tournament in Florida. And Joey convinces her, go have fun for a few days. I can, I can watch dad. And, you know, what, you know, part of the theme of this book is that time in your life where the child becomes the parent. Um, his dad can get confused easily. He gets disoriented. So he's really not allowed to leave the house without somebody because he can get lost. And, and um, you know, so Joey's, Joey's got him for a few days. And I set up a kind of an old family rivalry with another family in town. And though Joey's dad was gone for a long time and he, and he came back to Beaufort to retire, he still has a lot of bad feelings toward the Hammond family. And one night, because as we've mentioned, uh, there's a little romance introduced in the, in the story and Joey is next door visiting Leela and, uh, and he kind of falls asleep there and he goes back home and checks on his dad. His dad's fine. But very early that morning, they hear sirens. And this, you know, the patriarch of this Hammond family is found shot to death uh, just a block away. And Joey's not exactly sure that his dad was locked in the house the whole time. And his dad keeps a pistol that he'd always take fishing. Um, I, when he was out on the water, just in case they got a shark in the boat and there, or, and, and this is just based on personal knowledge. There was concern about boat thieves at one time, because you're out on the water, you're on a sandbar, anybody could come and take your boat. Uh, so he has this pistol, but now Joey can't find the pistol and, and he doesn't know if his dad was involved in this murder. And this present day murder, ties to some stories his father's been telling about the past and some family friends. And so there are, there's a 50 year old murder, murder and a present day murder. And Joey's trying to figure out how or if they're connected. And if this, his father who he's known his whole life is maybe a different person than Joey thought his dad was. So he, what you've done essentially is not created an unreliable narrator but an unreliable actor. Um, yes, which yes. I think is really very clever because you know the sorry the unreliable narrator has become something of a staple in psychological mm -hmm. suspense. Whether it's yes. somebody suffering from amnesia or somebody who's been in a car wreck or somebody who's just a habitual liar or running a con or mm -hmm. you know whatever it all is. But the reader, you know, in in the golden age books, the reader generally with a few exceptions, deliberate exceptions, was supposed to trust the narrator of the book, you know, yes. trust them to be telling you the truth. And in fact, in, in older books, you were also able to trust the police, which is, yes. you know, that all got blown away too. And now oftentimes corrupt cops and corrupt politicians are a real staple of crime fiction, but it didn't used to be that way in a, right. in a simpler era. I mean, I don't know, the January 6th hearings are probably going to, you know, exacerbate yeah. all this as we move along discovering the actual crimes that were committed um, by people you wouldn't have thought, you know, would do that. But anyway, um, I thought the fact that, that not only does Joey not know for sure what his dad did, but there's no clear evidence that his dad would know what his dad did. No, that's, that's true, especially with the recent uh, murder, because his dad really can't remember things. And, and I saw that with my own dad. He didn't, 
he didn't know if we went out to dinner or not. He didn't know if he had eaten. He couldn't, he used to love to watch sports, but he couldn't follow the teams anymore. He couldn't remember the players unless they had been there a long time. Um, and one thing that I always found just uh, amazing and confusing, and, and so does Joey in the book, is I never could remember how my dad, he knew he couldn't remember, but I don't know how he remembered that. That, that, that um, I always- I, Yeah, I see, your, I see your point. Wow, yeah. that's a level of self-awareness that you, you, know, <laughs> you would think he couldn't possess. So right. it's really the short-term memory that's affected by this Lewis body dimension. It, it was with my father. Years. Yeah. Right. It definitely was. So it was only he his can recall time. the old murder or the old, yeah, the yes. old thing the dad can, but he doesn't have any idea what's going on in the current murder. Correct. Yeah. yeah. Which I think is a is an amazing twist. Actually, the without I mean, it's a very sad story, the old crime. So yes. um, I think that I think Matt did that extremely well. And all. in fact, the whole book is 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 amazing. It's really, well, really thank you. well done. Um, which I'm not surprised at since I like the other books as well. Mm -hmm. But I also feel like this is a complete story. I don't, you know, do you, do you have any other plans for Joey? No, this is a standalone. So. Uh, wrote it to be one book. Uh, and next summer's book is a standalone as well. Yeah. Is it? So yes. you're going to give Nils a long vacation? Well, I don't know. I do have a plan to bring him back, but uh, it's not completely up to me. Uh, but I do have an idea for, and I've written more, I would say, mysteries than thrillers, but I do have an idea for a standalone Nils book that's a little more of a thriller than a mystery. So, um, so hopefully I'll get to write that someday. Well, the good news is there's kind of a turn back towards more old fashioned forms. I mean, there's a mm -hmm. debut coming out here, which is a real noir PI novel and so forth. And, you know, publishing, as you know, runs in cycles and yes, you know, something is really popular and publishers love it and they want it. And then everybody does it and everybody gets bored and then they want you to do something <laughs> else. And, yeah. you know, and you just sort of stick around. But I, I find that the older, uh, the classic forms don't really ever go away. And I, I think that private eye novels are a staple of crime fiction. And, you know, it, it, the moment I commented earlier this spring that the legal thriller had kind of fallen out of, out of fashion. And right. then all of a sudden, you know, we get the Lincoln lawyer and we get mm -hmm. some inspiration and now they're couple of legal thrillers that have popped up, a really good one by Joey Hartstone called The Loyal. Um, that um, are, Oh, great. Which I liked a lot. Um, and then there was another one by Robin Figaro in May. And so, you know, I don't lose hope because I think the Private Eye novel will get a lot more interest again. Yeah, I think Private Eyes and writers have a lot in common. They're kind of, we kind of feel like outsiders and and truth tellers sometimes mm -hmm. having to go against the system. Uh, and that's often true in the private eye novels. Well, you've had some wonderful yeah. critical success with this book. Lots of very good reviews. Yeah, um, very In nice. fact, it was your starred review, I think, in Publishers Weekly that caught my mm -hmm. eye and made me realize somehow, inexplicably, I have missed right. a Matt Goldman book, which is really <laughs> rare for me because normally when I follow an author, you know, I keep up. Right. So I think it was the paperback format that threw me. And, and I say that because what's happened, and it's not just Matt's publisher, but other publishers have um, started printing a small hardcover print run for library sales, they call it. And yeah. then a larger paperback that they think will do better at Barnes and Noble and, and other outlets. And, but they don't tell booksellers about the hardcover because really? they only they, they print them for libraries. And if somebody like me swoops in and grabs a whole bunch, there are fewer for libraries. And so that's, you know, that's what actually happened to me um, on this well, particular book. So I see. we were able to, we were able to storm in there and collect enough hardcovers for one of our um, book collector clubs because they require oh, an autograph first print of a book. Um, and so we did that, and it's a it's our July book for our notable new fiction club. But that's why we sold out. Uh, well, I know the paperback has already gone into a second printing. 
Right. So maybe That's they'll print, maybe they'll print some more hardcovers. Yeah. Well, no, it won't do any good. It, it yeah. not printing them doesn't help. I mean, you know, for <laughs> right. for book collectors, you have to get there and get that printing when it's there. But all I'm saying is, oh, I see what you're saying. The yeah. publisher doesn't want me as a bookseller to know there's a hardcover because uh, they didn't print it for me. They printed it for library sales, and um, and so it's become a little more of a challenge when I now see see books um i have to really pay attention or go and explore to see if there's in fact a hard i'll give you a heads up next time yeah well <laughs> now that i know you know right. that'll be fine but it's it sort of caught me by surprise but anyway we have had a happy ending here um <laughs> right so i'm glad that you feel like this has been such a success what's going on in your tv career because i didn't mention that matt is on a long and distinguished history as a screenwriter are you doing any work I'm that. not, uh, and that's by choice. Um, I have uh, really fallen in love with novel writing Ooh. and kind of set up my life to just to be able to continue doing that. Um, I really enjoy my days. It suits my personality better. I have, you know, the mystery community, as you know, just the most wonderful group of authors and readers and booksellers and and the libraries and I, I really feel at home here and I never quite did in TV and I was lucky to have a great television career and I worked with some amazing people and I learned so much about story and character and dialogue and I'm glad I did it but I think uh, th this shift has been good for me. Well, yeah. you wouldn't be a novelist you are if you hadn't had that previous writing Absolutely. experience. I, I yes. think that, you know, one of your great strengths is dialogue and obviously writing for a visual presentation is much more about dialogue than it is about internal monologue. And I'll say you right. certainly mastered the art of dialogue because you're so good at it. Oh, thank you. And I didn't learn how to write prose and TV. That's just from being a, a reader forever and really loving books. So well, there's fortunately there's a ton of classic crime that anybody who wants to write crime fiction can embrace and you can learn a lot yes. just from reading it. Yeah. <laughs> Excuse me. One of the things that we noticed during the pandemic is that the sale of classics, not just crime fiction, but classics in general, really accelerated. I mean, no, finally, really. you know, time to read War and Peace or timely, yes. you know, finally ah. time to read Moby Dick or something. So yeah. we had a we had a little tiny um, selection of classics but during the pandemic it's like I don't know even how big it's gotten but I see every week regularly now people are checking out you know um, oh that's great news yeah it is yeah but uh, and, and so I think that particularly for people interested in writing in the mystery field there's um, because structure is so important in a crime novel you can't get away with just blathering along you know, with no particular storyline, it doesn't work that way. It's probably right. one reason I like crime fiction so much is that I really like story. But there are so yeah. many examples of it and how to structure it that you can you can sort of self-educate, you know, because you can read a lot of the classics yourself and figure it out. Yeah, I just, I don't think very much about structure when I'm writing. I just think don't be boring, you know, keep it moving. So... Yeah, it's hard to but, imagine because your books have all had really remarkable structure. Are you I sure think, it's not subconscious from you from writing? Oh, books? it is subconscious from me. That's exactly what it is. But I don't outline. I don't make a plan. I don't. Oh, I don't. When I start writing, there's a lot I don't know. Um, sometimes I almost don't know the whole thing. But I do. From working on over 500 episodes of television. I have developed an internal sense of story. And that's, you're exactly right. It is from my subconscious. I can feel when I'm getting off track and, and I do know how to fix it because uh, I was telling a young writer today, you know, in TV on a Monday, you go in with a script that's been worked on and worked again on some more and worked on some more and rewritten and rewritten for the studio and rewritten for the network. And, all these rewrites and you think you have it perfect and you bring it to the actors and you hear them read it around the table and it stinks almost every time. And so you have days now to get it fixed. 
to so you can shoot it on Friday. So so uh, doing that for decades uh, really helped me learn story. I think dialogue came more naturally to me, character came more naturally to me, but I really had to learn story. Uh, and eventually I did, yeah. Well, it's partly structure, it's also partly pacing, you know? Mm -hmm. I mean, it, 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 you don't want it to drag in, as Elmore Leonard famously said, you want to leave out the words that readers skip. Um, yes. <laughs> and certainly writing for television or for movies is, um, is a lot more compressed. You can't digress. Um, so it does right. teach you to cut the fat out. So you probably learned to self-edit pretty carefully too. I, I did learn to do that. And I can't tell you how many times, I mean, it's in the triple digits that you write a script and you think it's perfect. And, and even sometimes you, you don't know it until you get into the editing room that we don't need that first scene. It's not, we, we, you can just take it away and then the story will be, it'll start better, it'll move faster. Um, and, and so I try to incorporate that into my book writing as well. Well, there are two things that I've learned over the course of editing hundreds of books. One is mm -hmm. that um, the writer has to get himself into the story. And so very often the first chapter or two of a novel turns out to be something you can cut because it was right. just the writer getting into it. But the other thing um, that, and you have to have, and I'm lucky I do, I think you have to have a really good memory as an editor is that a writer, you're reading a book in my case, a very short time, but let's right. say a day or something. But the writer worked on it for, let's give him eight months or something like yeah. that. And because of that, you start and you put it down and you come back to it and so forth, because inevitably you have to. And you forget as a writer that you've already said it. And mm -hmm. so, you know, you start again because you're, you're getting yourself going. And so I found that most of the time, occasionally it was the other way around, where people failed to write down what was in their head. But right. most of the time, what happened was that there was a lot of repetition. Yes. Or, you know, they'd are, and so I found my job as an editor most of the time was to prune it, you know, and say, you already said this. It's you a know, very important trust job. Your reader, or trust your reader to remember it. Yes. Um, and, and I think it's just the process of telling yourself the story as you're, you know, as you're working on it, staying in the story. Yeah. And the role of an editor is very important um, because you need, the writer needs that, that feedback and they need it from someone who understands and believes in their voice. I say it like, like what I love about my editor, Kristen Savick at Forge is when she gets in the boat, she's rowing in the same direction as I am. And it, it makes all the difference in the world. And I rarely had that experience in Hollywood. Um, yeah, no, but, I can imagine that, yeah. that you didn't. Um, and it's true. I mean, it's hard. And I didn't always do as well as I could have. But it's important for an editor to remember that it's your story, not the editor's story. And therefore, you know, the object is to help you tell your story and not the story the editor might wish you to be telling. Right, right. And, and I do have that with with Kristen and, and and I mean she's the only editor I've had this is mm. we're working on the sixth book now uh but I feel her suggestions are minimal based on what I experienced in Hollywood and she thinks I'm a great like I'm a very receptive author because <laughs> so because I guess some authors are not so respectful receptive no. one one her ideas are are great she's helpful and she's very respectful she always says this is your book your name's on it do what you feel is best uh but we come from two extreme different places where we think each other is great so it's it's nice yeah well that's a nice partnership i'm glad you know by staying in one house and having the same editor you've got continuity that is not always true no, I know it's not always true, and I who knows how long it'll last. But I hope it looks. I hope it lasts a long time. Yeah, I hope it does too, Matt. Let's call Patrick up and see what Patrick might want to sure. discover, or whether there's been any comments there or feedback or anything you'd I, like to say yourself, Patrick. Well, let's see here. Yeah, um, just looking at some of the comments that have come through. Um, Belinda uh, is just commenting about how much she liked the uh, the Audible uh, version 
Um, are you pleased with the way the audio turned out? Very much so, yeah. And I've received a lot of wonderful comments uh, from that. So you never know. I mean, I have to talk about TV too much, but I have, I have so much experience casting actors that I feel very particular about who reads the books. So I feel fortunate. Yeah, I am. Did you have uh, input into that decision? Yeah, Black. I don't know if Blackstone does it with everybody, but with but they give me veto power. So they'll send me three, and if I say, mm, "Can I hear some more?" they'll send me a few more. Uh, but you know, they they're pros at this, and they send me good people. So there's usually some good options to choose from. Mm. And they 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 will read uh, the first chapter of the book as an audition piece and. And because there's some other voices that come later in the book, I wanted to hear some of those too. Right. So, yeah. Uh, Laurel has a really good comment. Um, uh, she says, I found it refreshing that Joey sold costume jewelry and wasn't Mr. Award-winning architect, Mr. Financial Genius, uh, or had some larger than life career. Um, it's really interesting insight. Add it, she says that, it added to yeah. the realness of the story. Oh, and that's nice. She, she loved yeah. the book. Yeah. Oh, great. Uh, Mark, our friend, who's publishing it? Well, Forge, part of the uh, Macmillan MPS uh, group. Mm -hmm. Let's see here. What else? Um, oh, well, you've already addressed this. Uh, uh, Russ says, Matt, the sense of place this book evokes is superb. The characters are terrific, especially Joey and Leela. Curious how you selected Louis body dementia as the dementia Marshall is afflicted with. And he's just asking what, you know, what kind of personal connection you yeah. have with that. And just to, in case anyone's jumping in late, my father suffered from that. And, 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 and I, and, and I appreciate the comments about setting. I said it in Beaufort, a place I know it's all part of using every bit of my life. So I don't have to do a lot of research. <laughs> <laughs> That's Buford is a very worthy place, though. I mean, it, it, it is. It, you know, it's, I've, I've always been surprised there hasn't been more. You know, I tend to think when I think of that part of the world, I tend to think like Pat Conroy or something, you know. Well, that's where Pat Conroy is from. So yep. readers, uh, you know, a lot of readers know Buford. And, and in fact, on my publication day, I did an event down there with the Pat Conroy Literary Center, Wonderful. which was a, which was an honor. Yeah. Uh, they really embraced the book, which was nice. Let's see. Well, I was going to ask you. You know, I don't want. I don't want to pick pick away too too much personal stuff here, but I can only imagine that the experience of kind of going with your father through that, uh, you know, added to the emotional weight of the story. I can. Uh, are there a lot of uh, very personal details that's made their way into the book? There are a few in, in the book, the scene where Joey first realizes that his dad has a memory problem. I took pretty much verbatim from my life. Um, and it was hard at times because I really, like my dad is not Marshall Green. My dad wasn't a doctor. He didn't grow up in Buford. He just loved it there. It was my mom's side of the family that was from there. But uh, you know, I know like, I have two brothers and one of them had a hard time reading the book just because I wrote his voice. Uh, was, he a, was he a World War II guy? No, he wasn't that old. He was uh, Korea. Uh, he would have been Korea, uh, but he wasn't even he was born in 35. Okay. So, right. so when I was born during the Cuban Missile Crisis, and he was on call for that in the Air Force, but uh, so that's the age he was. He never, he was lucky. He never saw combat. Yeah. You, I, you know, despite your personal experience, did you have to do any kind of uh, research into the details of this kind of dementia to get some of the? the language right or some of the I, I did do some research into it I I have never claimed to be an expert on this I just wrote my personal experience but I did do uh I did read Mayo Clinic and several other 
uh, reputable uh, websites about the disease, some of the terminology, how it progresses, and compared that to my experience with my dad. There have been, um, Barbara could chime in too. I mean, there have been, an, uh, I won't say a huge number, but there have been a few that deal with similar issues, um, you know, about the, about the past being, mm-hmm. in, um, the one I can think of just off the top of my head is uh, Walter Mosley wrote a really nice, oh. nice one called, um, oh gosh, something about Ptolemy Gray was the name mm-hmm. of the character. Mm. And uh, there was like this, um, boy, talk about memory. I can't remember the exact plot, but uh, <laughs> right. there was something where this, this guy, he was in his 80s and um, was losing his memory fast. And there was a Faustian bargain that was made mm. where there was this real experimental drug that uh, in six months it would kill him. But he would have six lucid months. Oh, that's interesting. Where he would have access to all of that, you mm-hmm. know. And Mo- Mosley did a, a re- not to talk about another writer's book, but just because. That's fine. That, uh, it's a good writer to talk about. Yeah. 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 Um, let's see if anything else has come in. Oh, let me let me say, Patrick, as a corollary to that, crime fiction in the classic, you know, words cuts along the edge of social change. I mean, it's always been true that it wants to deal with that. And let's face it, we have an aging population, dementia and related diseases, you know, Alzheimer, mm-hmm. Lewis body, whatever it might be. My grandmother had um, dementia from diabetes. I can't remember what it's called, but she mm-hmm. had little pinpoint strokes that um, people with diabetes can suffer from. Yeah. So her memory was affected by that. But it's becoming a bigger and bigger issue in society and the role of the caregiver and, you know, the, the implications of, um, of what somebody might do, you know, in that, in that situation. I remember how upset everybody was when Robin Williams committed suicide. And then mm-hmm. when it was revealed that he had Louis, Louis Bottom dementia, everybody kind of went, well, okay, you know, there was... Unfortunately, we can't understand Anthony Bourdain in the same way, you right. know. Um, but I think a lot of it's people trying to make sense of, of that happening. A lot of it is people afraid it will happen to you, um, mm-hmm. you know, a personal a personal fear. But yeah. but the whole toll on society, um, I think, is there. And then, as we were saying earlier, it provides you with the opportunity to have an unreliable narrator or an unreliable actor in your yes. book, which, um, you know, takes away from the sort of amnesia thing that, you know, that that's so prevalent. Right. That's, that's really ingenious idea, you know, of having this past crime, you know, that that's just out of reach in some right. ways, but is there, if you can just access it. And then having it influence the present, you know, with new crimes start to happen as mm-hmm. we're digging back into that. Um, a really, really uh, inspired concept. Well, a lot it's of people an inspired are, book, I have yeah. to say. Are there any more questions? I don't know. Let's see. Um, <laughs> just people chiming in saying how much they've liked the book. A great read on many levels. Um, you just have some really nice fans here. On, uh, oh, nice. Yeah. That's good to know. Well, you certainly have two very ardent fans here with Patrick and me, Absolutely. Matt. So yeah. I'm delighted that um, that we have an opportunity to talk. I love Carolina Moonset. Um, now the paperback, as Matt pointed out, is um, available. So, oh, one, th- one thing, Barbara, is that, you know, we right. have, we have a, a customer who's a, kind of a famous musician um, named Nils Lofgren, uh, who is, a, you know, plays for Bruce Springsteen's band. And uh, I'll have to, next time he's in, I'll have to ask him. He'd probably be delighted to have a protagonist. I mean, not the current one, but of your <laughs> other books named Nils, yes. which is the only yeah. one that I can think of in crime fiction, really. Yeah, I think I think you're right. I think he's going back on the road. I think Springsteen is reviving um, in-person band, performance. Yeah. I thought for a long time that our Nils here in Scottsdale was a drummer for no particularly good reason, but then I just thought no, no. he was really a guitarist. <laughs> and he's been, he was very nice to me about it, proving, of course, that I haven't watched Springsteen. <laughs> yeah, he's super nice, super nice. Super oh, nice yeah, to he is. He's a lovely guy. A and we've been real, lucky to have had him as a customer for so many years. Guy too, really. Yeah, it really is. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, anyway 
Matt, it's been terrific. So um, let's let's plan on your next book coming out at a better time if you're for Scottsdale. Could we do that? I'm going to make a call tomorrow. All right. Yeah. Or, or we'll figure out Barbara something. Barbara, Patrick, thank you so much. It's really a pleasure. Thank you. thank you for this lovely book. And I hope everybody who is watching this has had a chance or will have a chance to read it. Uh, it's a perfect read for the 4th of July weekend coming up. So dash down to whatever your favorite bookseller is, if not us, and grab a copy. 